Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Urban. I'm the Director of Civic Engagement and Projects at the Greater Cleveland Partnership. Thank you for joining us today for our panel discussion, Within Reach, Closing the Gap Between Employers and Their Workforce. In the past several decades, Greater Cleveland and Cuyahoga County in particular has seen substantial business growth and job creation occurring in clustered locations outside of its central core. But ensuring that workers have practical transportation options to these employment centers has become increasingly challenging. Today, we'll hear from a panel of experts on the impacts that this, this development pattern is having on our regional economic health and learn about a new program being implemented this year that is designed to close the gap between workers and the workplace. Before we get started, one quick housekeeping item for our audience before we begin. I want to make sure that today's presentation is extremely valuable for you, so we ask that you submit all questions you might have for our panel by clicking on the question button in the control panel and typing your question there. So let's get started. Let's meet our panel for today's discussion. First, we have Bethia Burke, the president of the Fund for Our Economic Future, which is a funding alliance made up of more than 40 organizations and individuals dedicated to advancing economic growth with equitable access to opportunity for the people of Northeast Ohio. Good afternoon, Bethia. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Chris. Next, we have Vince Adamas, vice president for business growth and development at the Greater Cleveland Partnership. So the largest metropolitan chamber of commerce in the country, representing over 12,000 businesses that call our region home. Vince, good afternoon. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Chris. Happy to be here. Next, we have India Birdsong, the general manager and CEO of the Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority. It's commonly known locally as RTA, which provides transportation to up to th more than 32 million riders annually across Cuyahoga County. India, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Happy to be here. And finally, we have Dr. Flonse Caber, the Chief Operating Officer and Treasurer at RTA, and he has been spearheading efforts to address the last mile connectivity through a program called RTA Connect Works, which we will be hearing about this afternoon. Flonse, welcome and thank you for being here. Welcome. Thank you for uh, having me, Chris. Great. Thanks for being here and for all the, our audience members for being here as well. Let's get started. Bethy, we'll start with you first. Um, your work at the fund has involved quite a bit of research on the growth of job hubs in Greater Cleveland, uh, particularly those outside of traditional centers like downtown Cleveland. How has this growth and this growth pattern has created what is termed as a spatial mismatch? What is meant by that and, and how is that at play in Greater Cleveland? Can you talk a little further about that? Sure. Thanks, Chris. Um, so to help understand what we mean by this spatial mismatch uh, that we talk about, um, there I'm going to show you just uh, one quick visual. Um, what you see on your screen in front of you is the development of um, Cuyahoga County in 1950. And so you can see the, the red area on this map, and this was a map made by the Western Reserve Land Conservancy, is what was the developed area in 1950. And I just want you to keep your eye on the population um, that you see on the bottom of 1.4 million people. And then if you look now at the second uh, visual, um, you can see that that in 2000, by the year 2000, that red area, that developed area had really taken over the full county. So we are now a fully built out county. Um, but if you look at that population number at the bottom, it is still at 1.4 million. So we effectively have the same number of people um, and we have a similar amount of economic activity. The, the number of jobs aren't on that screen, but the number of jobs are effectively the same in that period. So we've got the same number of people, the same number of jobs over this ever growing footprint. And so when we say spatial mismatch, um, we're talking both about this spread um, and then um, about this this next slide that um, hopefully will pop up in just a second. Um, this next slide that shows where the concentrations of jobs and where the concentrations of people are. Um, so on this slide, the the blobs that you see, the red and green blobs, a very technical term, um, are what we call job hubs. So we see you saw that Cuyahoga County map. Um, sorry, it self-advanced. Um, you saw that Cuyahoga County map, and you saw how the the people and the jobs had spread and become more dense. And then here you see where there are concentrations of traded sector jobs. So those are those are um, um, uh, jobs in in uh, in companies that trade goods or services outside of the region and, and bring more money in. Um, and and you can see that those concentrations of jobs are 
separate from where the population centers are. So when we talk about spatial mismatch, we mean this sprawl and then the disconnect between where people live and where jobs are. And in particular, um, the other highlight on this map, um, uh, two things where there are high concentrations of unemployment. So when you're looking to expand your labor market, when you're looking to connect to job seekers, um, where we have higher concentrations of unemployment, those are pretty disconnected from these job hubs. Um, and um, uh, really important when we think about today's economy and the inequities we see in income and unemployment, where job growth has happened, um, it has happened away from communities that are predominantly populated by people of color. And so it's really contributing to the disparities we see in income and unemployment. Um, and Chris, just to, to make one more point, um, that this is this has left people facing really long commutes that are either really expensive because you have to own and operate your own car, um, which is an expensive proposition, or um, really time-consuming commutes uh, on RTA. And I know we have our friends from RTA talking here later, uh, and that they get a lot of, uh, I will say, on their behalf. Um, they don't—they didn't say this to me, but they get a lot of community flack about, you know, why can't why can't bus service or rail service um, bring people to where they need to go uh, faster and with less transfers? We're asking an organization, RTA, to serve that county that you saw where people and jobs spread further and further apart um, with a limited budget and transit works best when it is density to density. And so we can't expect to solve all of these challenges by just increasing um, large passenger vehicles. We also have to think of different ways to connect people and get them around. Interesting, thank you. Is there, is there any additional research that you've done that you conducted that shows kind of the economic impacts from this? I mean, obviously, you know, the, the impact on, on uh, communities of color is certainly something that is, is is a huge consequence and that has to be looked at. But is there, you know, an additional economic impacts from this type of arrangement? Yeah, so um, I think it's it's relatively straightforward. Uh, we hear, we hear, you hear at, G, at a Greater Cleveland Partnership hear a lot about companies who are looking to fill jobs um, and we can't find workers. There's a lot of factors that contribute to that. Um, one of them is if you are a worker and you're facing a three hour commute, it's going to be hard for you to show up every day on time. Um, and so when we hear, um, we hear a lot about the inability to find workers who are ready, available to show up for work on time. Um, this transportation issue, it's, we're seeing a workforce issue and there's really, there's a transportation issue underlying that workforce issue. Um, and so when we want to, uh, you know, solve that, we really have to think not just about um, job training and skills training, which are important, um, but how people are getting to work. You know, the other factor, Chris, that I would underscore there is, it, it is important that people have a reasonable commute if uh, to be able to show up for work on time. It's also true that when we think about the ability to do things like um, participate in upskilling opportunities, training for, for new jobs um, and better careers, if you're spending three hours a day commuting, that's three hours a day that you can't spend attending a class or a, um, or new training. Um, and it really it really um, makes it quite difficult to move up in the workforce um, if you're spending all your time um, getting to and from. Vince, I want to turn to you as well from your work at Greater Cleveland Partnership and previous roles that you've had at uh, municip municipalities and the economic development departments. You've had the opportunity to engage directly with with businesses throughout the county, uh, help them to grow and expand and find resources. Uh, can you kind of talk about the work and what you hear from businesses, um, especially in the last few years? Sure. Thanks, Chris. Uh, it's th there's not a lot of uh, difference of opinion up here on the panel, as as you could probably imagine. Uh, but you know, real quickly, you guys. Uh, Chris, you covered this already, but, but real quickly, we, we are the regional chamber of commerce with about 12,000 members. Uh, we cover eight counties, uh, but what we really do uh, with, with our department is uh, we, we help businesses with project management, site selection, talent, uh, energy solutions, public sector coordination, a bunch of other things. It's really about providing services to businesses and uh, the, the interesting thing is we are visiting about a thousand businesses a year right now, which is a great opportunity to, to talk and engage with the business community, find out what's making them tick, what are their issues, what are their needs. And the number one referral that we get out of all of our businesses is, is workforce recruitment. 
And in, in fact, what I like to describe it, everybody heard has heard the old joke about the top three issues uh, that, that were always important in new business uh, development. And then and the top three were location, followed by location, followed by location. And uh, since since the Great Recession, since we've come out of the Great Recession, that's that's flipped a little bit. Uh, and since 2012, give or take, every year is a little bit tougher. It seems like every year is a little bit tighter in terms of the workforce availability in the region. Uh, obviously, uh, dirt properties, buildings, new land for development are, are still critical. But uh, we find that really the top three issues have now changed to workforce, workforce, and workforce. Um, so much so that Chris, when, when we talk to companies, it's really interesting. In years past, if there's some other economic development folks out there in the audience, they'll, they'll recognize this. But in the years past, we would talk to a company and they'd tell us what they're looking for in an expansion opportunity, what kind of property, what, what geography, those types of things. And we'd, we'd go and we'd come back, we'd sharpen our pencils and, and show them a list of opportunities. And, and at the end of the day, uh, the CEO or the person making the decision would say, well, we're gonna go over here because that's, that's where I live. You know, we, we spent a lot of time rolling up our sleeves coming up with the objective analysis, and I guess we could have just cut to the chase from the start, but, uh, you know, that that's oddly enough ended up happening more often than you would suspect. Well, over, over time, that's come, come to bite those companies because the areas where they live may not necessarily be the areas where they're drawing their workforce from. So there's 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 basically been a new model of decision making out there, almost a switch from top down to bottom up. Not that the folks in the on the bottom parts of the organization, the bottom parts of the hierarchy, are, are literally making the decisions. But when we talk to businesses nowadays, it's all about I need to go where I can find a workforce. And and the interesting thing is that is true for the business retention activities that we engage in in other words the companies that are already here in the region and are expanding great um or or the business attraction opportunities that we have uh, the first thing out of a consultant's or the business's mouth and an attraction opportunity is show me the workforce they want to know where the workforce is what are the skill levels those types of things and and in order to make that first cut to to get onto a short list and, and really start discussing other factors. We, we've got to talk about workforce availability. So those things are are really the the critical pieces, and uh, that that's what that's why we're here today. Frankly, because this is such a uh, business retention issue, as everybody can imagine. We live in a world where uh, capital is is fluid money can go they can stay in cleveland it can go to detroit it can go elsewhere and same with companies uh obviously we've we've got a a great mix of all blind companies who aren't going to pick up and uh move their heavy equipment perhaps but we have seen it in the past and many more companies nowadays are technology-based or knowledge-based companies that could literally pick up and go elsewhere and we, we've got to convince them to stay here or to come here uh, based on the workforce available to us in the region. So that, that's really uh, our interest in, in this whole issue here. Um, and we, we're very excited to be working with our partners, uh, Bethia and RTA, and helping the business community and the municipalities out there come up with some creative solutions to this issue. Well, that's that's all I've got, Chris. Thanks, Vince. Appreciate that overview. Uh, India and Flossa, I want to turn to you. I think this is really the, the heart of the conversation we want to have today. Um, but basically, get a better understanding of how RTA has really been you know, working to serve, again, 32 million riders a year, uh, the predominance of which I know are, are going to work, going from home to work. 
um, but working on how, how RTA has been working to close the gaps, these last mile gaps uh, that are kind of created by these, these sort of spatial mismatches. Uh, you know, want to turn it over to you to kind of see what research, what work you guys have been doing to, to work on addressing this issue. Certainly a lot of work at play with, with system redesign and other, other uh, programs that are being implemented by RTA uh, this year. But want to hear from you about uh, this new program that uh, is looking to, to close that gap. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. I'm going to actually ask Dr. Caver to start and then I will round it out so we can discuss the program that we have uh, coming up for pilot. So thank you, Ms. Birdsong and Chris. Um, we should be sharing a set of slides. They should be showing up here. Do you see them? Oh. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, we want to kind of talk about um, build upon Bethany's description of what the issue is, but then um, also talk about how innovation and strategy can link to coming up with creative solutions. And Ms. Birdsong is going to talk about those solutions uh, as they are coupled to our vision that we have for the system redesign. And so we're going to split this. I'll do some of the front matter and Ms. Birdsong is going to come and uh, unveil a program that we're work, looking to be able to work with community partners to be able to solve some of the issues that members of our community may have. As a bit of a background, I want to just talk here first about, you know, who are our riders? And the slide in front of you gives you an idea uh, of the makeup of our ridership. There are members of our community, 79% are minority, 37% earn less than $15,000 a year, 26% are students, 77% are transit uh, dependent. Uh, and the most common trip purpose for us is a work, uh, a work commute trip. Brought this from Bethany's group uh, as I uh, attempt to use this frequently. When we look at the 1950s and we look at 2000 era, we see this dispersion. And as we disperse, uh, just the aggregate cost of communities have uh, increased. And that's for travel, water, sanitation, and all of the other civic services that we have. And so this dispersion without more people uh, makes for a challenge, particularly as jobs and people uh, become uh, disjointed. And as a foundation to uh, these terms that we use, spatial mismatch, mobility divide, we like to talk about the mobility divide. And we posit and present to the community a belief that the mobility divide is equally as important as the digital divide. In our most recent year, we saw how the digital divide uh, made for more difficult education and other aspects of the community when uh, COVID hit. And we believe that the mobility divide still has some of those items that are similar uh, with the digital divide, and particularly that they both perpetuate economic inequities. So if there are inequities in the system, uh, both of these divides perpetuate uh, and magnify those issues. As we look at transit and you think of the individuals that we describe to our, uh, on our system and who we fight for every day, transit is a social justice inequity issue because, it facilitates, because when we don't deal with it, uh, we find ourselves having people resign to places where they cannot uh, access the economic mobility and other benefits of the community. And so as we create and facilitate better transportation, we also create the economic mobility necessary for more people to partake uh, in a, an effective local economy. I have a few visuals that will build upon uh, Bethia's slides uh, that will kind of help kind of hone in this mismatch, but also the equity nature of it. This first slide, when you see the red, if you can't read all of it, the red are, since the darker the red, uh, the higher level of poverty there is in that census tract. The light greens are where the jobs are. And so the darker the green, the more jobs. And so the point of this uh, slide is that the areas that have the highest poverty are mismatched, or there's a distance between them and the areas with the most jobs. In this next slide, the darker uh, green is uh, communities with a larger percentage of workers with no vehicle. 
Uh, and so uh, when you look at the places where, a, where it gets darker and a large amount of people have no vehicle, you see that they are also uh, disjointed from these areas where the jobs are. And so we see that uh, poverty or, or not being able to have a vehicle uh, is exacerbated by the fact that uh, the job hubs are, are not around those folks. We have a different way to take a look at it. And this just uh, is uh, an assessment that shows the job hubs. But what I do wanna have people to understand is that when we look and move here, we see that the blue lines here are our current systems. And so RTA has been a partner with the community and understands where the job hubs are. And so we can get to the job hubs, but now it begins to be an issue is that, is the place that we're going to uh, friendly for people who must walk that last mile, right? And so I have several circles just to kind of orient our conversation. Uh, the top right-hand circle is the Collinwood and Euclid uh, job corridors there. And so what you'll see is that uh, when we're inside of the county there, we service that area. Now the most popular uh, job component in that area now would be the Euclid Amazon plant, right? And so we have a lot of service that gets you out to that Euclid Collinwood area. The bottom right hand is Solon. And so we get uh, and have a very strong service in the Solon area. But what you see is that the bus uh, uh, stays largely on the main thoroughfare there and understanding that some of those streets are uh, without sidewalks and are not navigable by individuals in public transit, there still becomes some density. In the bottom left, you see the Strongsville work area. And so uh, we stay there on the main area, but much of the place to the west of our bus routes we haven't been able to service well. We did service them about 10 or 15 years ago and found that there was not a large ridership, but still an area that could benefit for the, from allowing riders to be able to traverse it. And then the top left portion of it is the aero zone or the airport zone. And so as you guys know, our rail system takes you uh, to about the, to the airport and to Brook Park, but there's still a large point of that, uh, of that job hub where we're not able to serve as well through our bus and network. And so it presents to us a, a problem that says we have to do something differently because the fixed route bus may not be the tool to be able to more easily navigate the securities communities where these job hubs are. And so uh, the issue is that people with our cars need to live in areas that have pedestrian amenities or frequent tra uh, transportation service. The policy need that we have to have for a community is that in order to grow family sustaining jobs, we need to have them in areas that uh, the incremental next job, uh, we need to have them in areas that are served by transit. Uh, we, we were very happy with Amazon's uh, pre-work where they wanted to make sure that they were on lines uh, or in areas that had transit access. However, the fact is that we can't change what has already occurred. So many jobs are located in these outlying areas where the last and first mile of a commute is not easily navigated, especially in our winters, right? And so one may be able to obtain and access the Solon job area uh, during, the, during the summer, but in the winter, it becomes unbearable. And as these essential industries find, and as uh, Mr. Uh, Vince said, you know, the employers want workforce. And so the demand for the employees are growing. Uh, Ms. Birdsong will now introduce our project overview with an innovation that we think can help to solve this. So thanks, Dr. Caver. Um, as Dr. Caver mentioned, and you set a really good base, I think, for understanding what the issue is overall and how RTA may be able to assist with that effort in sort of um, narrowing the mobility gap. Uh, and or the mobility divide. So our team basically put our heads together and uh, this pilot program that we're gonna introduce you to was really a brainchild of the operational division um, that has that firsthand knowledge of being able to provide that service, whether it's paratransit, bus, rail, or trolley. So we have in front of you the RTA response, Connect Works. Um, the project overview basically takes you through um, a couple of bullet points, which really explain to you, this is a short-term pilot. So I love pilot programs. I think pilot programs are awesome because it gives you the opportunity to do things that you may not normally have done, right? So it lets us think outside of the box. 
be a little bit less traditional in our thinking and, and more planner-like. Um, so this is a short-term pilot program, six months to a year um, in, in the initial phases to be able to connect work sites throughout the, uh, the county and the area to RTA stops. So this is just not Cleveland proper, right? We're looking outside of ourselves, so to speak, and thinking about where is the first last mile connection problem? And how do we start to think about how we can evaluate, observe, and provide connectivity between those job sites and those individuals that may not quite get to the front door, taking our current service. So there's always that opportunity for four block, eight block, for example, uh, walk, or even somewhere as upwards of a couple miles to think about how do you get from the last RTA stop to your job site if there is not readily uh, available transportation at the current moment. There's always a price tag that comes along with it. So RTA really wanted to be able to think about, we wanted to think about how do we evaluate that before we have to commit to putting it in our regular service plan? We always hear a lot of uh, complaints, as mentioned, I think Bethia mentioned it, she was absolutely right, so kudos to you, put you on the team. Um, and I think that we back you up in saying that we're going to get a lot of complaints. So we understand that. So the problem is, is that transportation is not free. It is largely connected to ridership. I believe that Dr. Caver mentioned a couple areas that may have had service before, ridership wasn't as high. When we have to juggle the, the, the apple cart, so to speak, sometimes we take it away from places that may not have high ridership. Well, this is an opportunity for employers to really partner with those neighborhoods and those employees that really need to be able to bridge that gap. Um, it's also nice to be able to look at not easily uh, navigated street systems to be able to put buses on, or uh, shorter buses, if you think about it that way, vans, what have you, to be able to get those places to those uh, work sites. So we will soon begin accepting allocate, uh, applications. We've been working on this probably for, and correct me if I'm wrong, Doc, probably about three or four months or so um, from inception of kind of being the, the brainchild to actually making it a reality. Um, we also looked through our budget and we wanted to put our money where our mouth was. So we actually are going to pony up and I'll tell you about that a little bit later, upwards of $200,000 for the first phase of this program, and uh, which essentially will cover about 50% of the service costs, uh, depending on the um, applications that come in and the detail of the request, um, we can evaluate from that point. Next slide. Okay, so let's get into the applicant responsibilities. Um, this can be any entity, any government, business, nonprofit, or a general team um, can apply. The applications will come in to us just like any other procurement. Um, the applicant is supposed to des design the service. So again, we serve as the SME. We serve as a subject matter expert. Um, we do transportation all day, every day. So when it comes to planning your route, figuring out uh, what that balance looks like between driver, mileage, um, also scheduling, we will help with that. Um, that's including the service area, the hours of operation, um, all just becoming, making it real, right? Actually becoming a reality. Um, the applicant will actually supply the vehicles, uh, the operators, and the scheduling. So we'll assist with the actual um, creation of it. We will assist with the technical uh, experience that may be needed to be able to craft the right route, but the actual vehicle and operator will come from the applicant that is what they contribute. Uh, we currently are a unionized workforce at RTA, so we cannot put our operators on pilot programs that are not part of the regular service. Um, the applicant has to meet all of the RTA requirements for insurance and regulatory compliance. That's, that's pretty standard. Um, and then RTA, in turn, will pay up to 50% of the service cost for selected proposals that come through. Next slide. So what are we responsible for? You heard a lot that is on the part of the applicant. We will advertise the launching of the program. So we will pony up sort of our marketing and advertising and, and media um, expertise and hours. We will do that as part of the package. We'll also organize a webinar to launch the program, such as this one. Um, we'll provide technical route planning, as I mentioned before. Um, we will market it. We will provide up to $200,000 for the pilot. 
and we will seek additional funding to help grow the program if it goes beyond the six months or the year. Next slide. So here's the schedule. This is what we are proposing for the schedule of the pilot. Um, of course, the webinar today, and then we go into releasing the request for proposals. I mentioned that this is gonna be very similar to a typical procurement at RTA. So we're looking at a pretty tight timeline um, because we want to be able to have this coincide with some of the other projects that we have ongoing at RTA. Um, April, we're looking at the release, uh, pre-proposal conference also in April. May, we'll, we expect to receive and evaluate proposals. July, uh, approval and award. And then October, we'll go ahead and institute the service. So that gives you a little bit of time to be able to create the routes and also get um, uh, your team together as far as sponsors that you may want to have for your side of the program to match our $200,000. Again, we can also evaluate for higher amounts um, if that comes through in the proposal project and process. And then also we can look for extensions on timeline as well as needed. Uh, there are some questions regarding the timeline and the weather. We're trying to get this in before we get into the snow again. Um, so that's why we have a little bit of a tight timeline here. We also are looking at working this around our um, service redesign that starts in June. So if you look at the schedule, it kind of skips over that timeline to be able to start in the early fall. We imagine that that's when school is back in. That's when a lot of folks will be going back to work. Um, hopefully with the COVID situation we have going on as well, folks will be able to be a little bit more settled. And some of those manufacturing sites, for example, may have a better handle on those folks that are coming back in their doors to work. Um, so with that, I think we're in the question side next, if I'm not mistaken, Doc. Yep, there we go. Um, and if you have any questions for it, um, feel free to ask us while we're here today. Uh, otherwise, our project lead is Mary Beth Feek. She is our director for planning and development, and her information uh, is, is there on the screen. Thank you. Thank you both for the presentation. Very informative. Really appreciate you both being here to, to talk about this, this exciting program. Uh, we do have some questions coming in on the chat. Um, I can kind of go through those here. First one we have coming in, uh, knowing the income of the majority of riders is so low, is there anything that RTA is doing to improve pricing so the cost is not as much of a barrier as the length of a ride or walking between uh, the bus and, and their workplace? So I'll, I'll, I can take that. Um, I can start out and then Doc, of course, jump in if you like. Um, we actually won, I believe it was a $100,000 uh, pilot, again, with Paradox Prize. And it's supposed to uh, basically allow us to evaluate that exact question. What does it take for us to reduce fares um, in, in those kind of situations? Is it applicable? Who does it apply to? Um, what is the right balance of, of fare, um, uh, fare collection when it comes to those that are in that kind of lower income gap uh, bracket? So we actually have a task force that's uh, assigned. We're working with the centers. Um, and a couple other um, small organizations that are thinking about how to track that. Um, it will include a, again, a pilot program, so a, uh, a specific group of tracked passes to be able to see what that looks like at the outset. And also at the end of the pilot, um, we will evaluate our fair um, enforcement along with how much we pay or how much we charge for those individuals who are in that lower income bracket. So I would expect we should be able to complete that by the end, I wanna say another six to eight months or so, we got slowed down a little bit by the pandemic, but we did get that award through the Paradox Prize to evaluate that. So we are taking a look at what that looks like and um, are we at the right price point and should we charge that for everyone? Thank you. Got a couple other questions coming in specific to the to the program. Can you explain a little further on the two hundred thousand dollar component of the project? Is it up to two hundred thousand per project, or you'll make two hundred thousand dollars available across all pilots? Uh, just some more clarification, I think, on on uh, the two hundred thousand dollar component uh, that RTA is putting forth. Sure. So the two hundred thousand is the total kitty, so to speak, that we have right now for the pilot. Um, ideally, Doc, I think we talked about um, a max of two projects within that 200,000, um, but we're 
I would imagine we don't want to split it too much because we want to make it effective. So we don't want to reduce it, say, for example, four or five ways with that particular amount. Um, I would imagine that we're going to probably be looking at no more than two pilots with that particular kitty and then having that match. So you're looking effectively, uh, I'd say a maximum of $400,000 per um, project. If it's one, it's 400. If it's two, it's 200. But again, if we get a larger uh, sponsorship from an applicant, then we can always reevaluate that based on the, the pilot timeline. Uh, Doc, did I miss anything? Uh, you're correct. Okay. And India, I mean, I, I don't know what you would do with it on the other end, but if there was a flurry of activity and there were, you know, 50 businesses who said, we really need to look at this first mile, last mile issue, that would be informative in and of itself and, and could spur, you know, something else down the line as well, right? I would imagine. Yeah, Bethy, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, that would be awesome. If we could get that kind of response, that would be great. What we may even look at doing is combining some of those proposals that maybe overlap to look at a larger kitty for each uh, particular project. So if you've got, I'm just making this up, you know, 10 uh, proposers and four of them overlap and they've each got two sponsors that are willing to give 200,000, well, then you're probably looking at somewhere between a six and $800,000 kitty per project. And maybe what we do is say, okay, well, let's look at the time frame. Maybe we want to handle two projects at a time and look at an extension of the project over the next two to three years with each project having a larger um, operating budget. And then our TA, of course, would go back to our coffers and, and see what we can do because the more the merrier. Um, so I definitely would encourage people to get multiple sponsors if they can to be able to increase that. But we figured 200,000 was a good place to start uh, for us to be able to, to get a good solid project for six months. Right, another question, uh, just repeating, who is the eligible applicants? Who are the eligible applicants for this uh, pilot program? Doc, do you wanna go back? Yeah, there you go. There you go. We spent too much time together talking about this. He can go back before I can ask. <laughs> you wanna go over that part, Doc? Um, yeah, I'll take it. Uh, if you guys still see my slide. Uh, so the applicant is any entity, government, business, nonprofit, or team. And so as we think about you know, how a, an individual or a group may look at the RFP. The reason that we have an RFP is because we don't want to preclude it, right? We don't want to tell folks that it has to be a government or it has to be a chamber or regional ch or local chamber of commerce. And so uh, we're going to be reviewing it. So anyone who believes that they have an idea uh, that connects uh, workers and jobs and transportation, we would like to review it. Mm -hmm. And let me also add this, and I think he's absolutely correct. This is part of our new mantra. We actually are unveiling a new mission, vision, and value statement for RTA. Um, it'll be coming uh, to the public probably within the next coming month or so. Um, but the mission basically is to connect the community. That is our goal. So we still are going to be able to provide, you know, safe, reliable, on time, courteous service. However, we really want to take a look at how we can become a leader in the innovation space. And this is just one example of how we are trying to become part of the solution and not always just take the complaint. Um, so we definitely want to encourage partnership and we would encourage folks again to be able to get those sponsors and talk about where their needs are because there might be an opportunity um, and we will identify that if we see two proposals that come in that overlap maybe there's a way to marry those kind of um, those need assessments into one more robust pilot. It's very flexible at this point. Right. We've got a couple more questions sort of related to this toward the 50% match and the $200,000 commitment. Is, is RTA's advertising and promotional costs contained in that and uh, other components being uh, operator wages and the cost of vehicles? What's, what's covered in, as part of this? This 50% match. Okay. Doc, go ahead. You got it. Yep. Yeah. So, um, what what we would expect is that the applicant would provide for us a total cost of the program uh, from their view, and um, those items related to the transportation, so the operator that they use. Uh, 
let's just say they may have to lease uh, access to an app uh, so that it can be demand response and, and be creative with how people know when the, uh, the bus or the van is coming around. So we would consider all of those aspects. As it relates to the marketing, that would be a part of our pace and that wouldn't be uh, exactly a part of the $200,000. We would do so incrementally into, with, with our business and our assets. Mm -hmm. Another question about geography. Um, any are applicants open only to Cuyahoga County, or can they be outside of Cuyahoga County? Yeah, I surely. Go ahead, Doc. Go ahead. Go ahead. First, uh, you take it. Um, if you want to go, I'm trying to figure the slide. Go back one or two. Uh, yeah, so it will have to be in Cuyahoga County because that's our jurisdiction. There you go. Uh, quite a few questions I'm trying to work through here. <laughs> That's good. Let's see. While you're looking, Chris, I will say that um, this is a uh, first time, I believe, for RTA to be able to engage in something like this, which is really kind of a hands on project for more than just an internal staffing right this is something we want to bring other folks into so um, it is flexible while there are certain things that are not such as the the geography of it because we're bound by federal regulation um, we also are spending public dollars right so we have to be able to account for where those the dollars are going and also what's coming out of the program so i will say that we will work with the uh, su successful proposer to work through tracking to work through ridership count to work through uh, the data that really proves that this is worth its salt. So at the end of the day, we will also perform an analysis that determines whether or not that service is worthy of putting in the service plan permanently, or whether or not we need to refine the process to figure out maybe there's another avenue for that service for that proposer that RTA can assist with as well. So we're excited to see what comes out of it. Um, and really this is the way we believe to be able to put the destiny right of the workers in the community's hands and not necessarily wait for RTA to come up with it in their service plan, you know, once or twice a year. Let's be able to blur the line a little bit, do a little bit of due diligence in between those service uh, changes and be able to kind of kill two birds with one stone, so to speak, um, and, and really hear from the community and, and work towards it on the private side that way as well. Another question, I think, for, for the entire panel, really, uh, perhaps. So public transit riders, public transit shoulders a lot of responsibility to get the workers to the job, but what responsibility, from your experience, do municipalities have to install the other infrastructure components like sidewalks uh, to make that last mile more accessible, more, more uh, enjoyable uh, and passable uh, for transit riders? Chris, I'll, I'll take a first stab at that, and that is that uh, employers recognize that this communities of choice are so critical now uh the the old way of doing things you know least amount of services uh doesn't matter what it looks like doesn't matter how community functions i, I know that's easy to say but uh more and more communities now are recognizing that the more pedestrian amenities they provide the more transit amenities they provide the more they provide a community feel to their to their downtowns or central areas, the more people want to locate there. Uh, so more and more, it, you know, it's it's almost a free market choice where people are are moving with their feet to go to communities that have all those types of amenities. So the, the I think the smarter communities are realizing that now and starting to gear up so they can have more pedestrian, more transit, more bike amenities, so those types of things. And, and Vince, I also think it gets back to something you said in your comments about changing the decision-making framework about the location decision in the first place, where um, you know years ago, it might've been that we looked at the number of workers in a certain mile radius, but not really at the, the ways in which people would get to work. And so there was a built-in assumption that those workers were gonna drive a car and park in a parking lot, um, where when we look at uh, expansion or attraction deals now, 
really trying to change the mindset where um, this question of is there a bus route, is there a sidewalk, um, are there bike paths in addition to is there highway access, um, building those in on the front end also alleviates the burden of always having to build new, um, but rather looking for ways where we can use our, where we have an existing strong built environment uh, for, for location decisions. Great. Interesting question coming in. So in Pittsburgh, the Port Authority of Allegheny County recently released a long range transit plan with new lines and extensions to existing high capacity transit service. Does RTA's new strategic plan include any service expansions or high capacity corridors that could help address some of the issues on a long-term basis? Yes, yeah, so Ms. Bergson, I'll take that. So um, thanks for the question. Um, our, our plan uh, and system redesign is focused on aggregating the community's will related to transportation. And what we learned from our community meetings was that uh, when given an opportunity, uh, the community wanted us to ensure that we increased frequency uh, in transit with, in corridors with a high propensity for transit. Uh, those corridors also helped to uh, link to our strategic plan because they're corridors where equity is a major concern. And so what our strategic plan attempts to do is it attempts to, uh, to allow RTA to better serve jobs, education, and healthcare. And those are the three priorities. And what you'll find in our system redesign is that we've been able to make more frequent service on many of the strong corridors within our community. We still have access to all of the job hubs. The difficulty is not that, it, it, the reality is that it isn't that we don't go to the community, is that once we get there, we're not able to circulate through that community in an effective way. What you'll find in our system redesign, some things that we're very uh, proud of, uh, is that you'll find that when a route uh, has an opportunity to finish its trip at one of these outlying areas, it is prioritized and, and the routes will increasingly navigate to either, either a large job uh, center or, or hub, it will aggregate and stop at a university or school, or it will aggregate and stop near a hospital. And so uh, what you'll find is that we'll have more one seat rides to those areas. Let me give you an example. Uh, the 14 route, which travels down Kinsman Avenue, uh, had historically stopped at Warrensville and Van Aken. Uh, you would then have to catch a different bus to go further out to the jobs that are at Beechwood. And so, uh, these are the jobs along Eaton Place, and uh, increasingly the the jobs at or near um, I, I just name, but the the new version of Legacy Village. I just lost the name because we're talking. But what we're going to do now is we're going to have the 14, where a person who's in the center of the city who's going to those jobs that are out there is able to take one vehicle. They'll be able to take one vehicle to the job Pinecrest to Pinecrest. That vehicle will also circulate over to a Hoosier, and it would also be very close to uh, Tri-C's Eastern Campus, right? And so now we've just made for a trip that would have had a variable because the transfer at uh, at Warrensville and Van Aken, the bus could have not come, you're sitting there and you're waiting. Now when that person gets on on 79th and Kinsman, they're able to continue straight out uh, and get to the jobs, education, and healthcare. And so you'll see that in several other routes, you'll see that in a better trip down Lorraine that doesn't have to stop at West Park, but it then take you to Camp Corner and further out in Fairview Hospital without that extra trip. And so we prioritize those items. Uh, surely it's a living document, but we're very proud of what we're gonna be able to offer the community as it relates to linking people to jobs, uh, education and healthcare. Well played. Well played. Right, is RTA anticipating that the pilot provides free service to the pilot participants or is there a fairer component going to be associated with this? Yeah, so we have we we have not um, we will accept the proposals as given by the uh, by the community. Again, uh, with an RFP process, we want the innovation not to be hindered by our rules. And mm -hmm. so, um, let's say you could imagine, you know, that it could be free, but you could imagine that 
a set of companies could figure out some other way to charge individuals. Um, but surely we will evaluate them without RTA being uh, the albatross around the, around the innovation. Absolutely. Um, this is really a, a way to kind of, again, think outside the box. And we are ponying up or, or, or offering 200,000 to be able to support the project. Um, if it's something where it fits within the, the scope of the budget, and it's something that the proposer wanted to be able to allocate partial funding to, to cover fares, to be able to evaluate that as well as the spatial mismatch, then we can definitely participate in that. Um, because we are not dedicating our internal resources to the actual driving of the, uh, the transportation vehicles, we have a little bit more flexibility. Um, but I will say that I will caution proposers to look at this as an opportunity to provide free fare, right? At the end of the day, the goal is to be able to figure out the mobility divide and provide service on a long-term basis between these employer sites and where the folks are, are you know, picking up the end of the line for RTA. So we will have to evaluate at the end of the pilot program whether or not the ridership was there based on the geography of the route, not just the route being free. So I, I will say that, you know, caution people to think about that part as well, um, because it will have to show a work product at the end of the pilot program. But if part of that um, is, a, is a free pass, then that's something we can definitely work through. <clears throat> Another good question I hear that will RTA help applicants to develop their proposals? You know, that just may not have the wherewithal to understand what they need to put together. Is, is, is RTA available to help uh, with the development of those proposals? Sure. That, that actually is a question I think that came up internally when we were kind of coming up with this project. Um, I would say the idea is that we would be available within reason. We don't want to give anyone any um, kind of leg up on the competition to say that we've, we've helped, you know, create their proposal. But I think if there's a technical uh, sort of aspect to the assistance that's needed to be able to fill out the application or understand what a term means or, you know, definitions and explain how things are connected, absolutely, we can, we can help uh, with our, our procurement department kind of overseeing that process. Um, we want to have people be encouraged to be able to apply, but what we don't want to do is um, essentially put in our own application for our, our own <laughs> pilot. Great. I'm going to get one more, I think, good question here that just came in for the for the full panel here. Given the data about sprawl increasing, yet the population numbers remaining flat, how can local businesses, in your guys' mind, play a larger role in contributing to public transportation to enable the system to respond to increasing spatial mismatch, um, spatial mismatch with the job centers? What are your thoughts on, on that? If if uh, if you guys like, I I start the conversation. So I think as a community, it's uh it's really imperative that we start to think of the workers in part of the location analysis, and that's what Vince and what Bethany have talked about. I think as a community and as a region, uh, you know, we really have to think about you know how do we incentivize jobs and job locations. Mm -hmm. uh, the incremental job that comes to Northeast Ohio is probably uh, most equitably shared with everyone if it is uh, possible for it to be on a corridor that's well served by transit. And so when we give uh, just community policy choices, being near uh, a well served transit line, depending upon the industry, uh, which should be a benefit, and it should be something that we, you know, think through as a community, as community planning organizations, you know, dealing with with NOACA, and they've done a lot of studies around this, is that we should try to incentivize those organizations and those folks in the business arena to to locate on on places that are well served. If you're going to have transit dependent workers, uh, it makes the most sense to to use the current resources such that. Uh, we can incrementally and very with small increments service those communities. Again, I'll use the, the Amazon when Amazon came to Euclid and Randall Mall. Uh, surely they could have gone you know, to any green space in Northeast Ohio, but if you're gonna have workers who are coming from the city, 
Veno lines that are served 24 hours a day, uh, 365 days, just makes that easier and more obtainable to more residents throughout our community. Yeah, I think those are really well made points, Doc, um, and that um, I would um, underscore a couple of things. One is know how your workers get to work. Um, I think that uh, we were surprised when we did some early conversations with businesses, um, how there was an underlying assumption that everybody drove to work and that um, when uh, this issue came you know, in front of people, they asked and they found out that people were taking um, transportation, public transportation to work, uh, and that that can then tell you, to Doc's point, if you have to move, how that will impact people who work for you. Um, so know how your people get to work. If you're going, if you're going to move to a new spot, um, uh, know how important transit is in in that location decision. And then as a broader community, I think we can think about how job movement. Um, isn't incrementally helping Northeast Ohio. It's good, you know, we have to balance um, how tax revenues come into different cities and thinking about how we should be looking for job growth rather than job movement um, and how we might uh, support policies that drive incentives in a way that concentrate growth so that an organization like RTA can better serve the people who work for you, I think are ways that a local business can think about supporting. There are a lot of policy considerations in that question. It's a great question. Uh, people, and that's residents and businesses, and, and those of us in, in the, the planning or development sectors uh, have to be aware of, of the impacts of these movements. Uh, at the end of the day, yes, as much as we are talking up uh, the availability of workers, when a, when a business needs to expand or, and they can't do it on their current site, they need to move somewhere, right? So if they need five or 10 acres, there's only so many places. You guys showed the map. It's, 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 it's a, one of my favorite maps. It's really district, descriptive. Uh, not only shows population, but it shows the lack of development opportunities. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks that one. Uh, you know, those yellow spots, they're few and far between. So if a company wants to move and they need five or 10 acres, their options are exceedingly limited. So to the extent that we collect, big collective, we can support communities in the central areas to redevelop those areas, often takes money and, and, and funding, no question about it. But we, we've got to be willing to stay the course on that. Totally agree with that. One thing I would add is that, uh, you know, I think about communicating with the public transit agency that you've got in your area. Um, I, I so often see companies that make these decisions and then public transit is an afterthought. Um, and it's really difficult to be able to kind of rearrange the service model that you've got. And some areas, you know, some states or, or cities have not had a, a complete service overhaul in, in upwards of 10, 20, even I say 25 years. So when you actually are asking for that service to kind of cater to your specific building, it's a little bit more complicated. So I would definitely have those conversations more early, earlier and more often um, to make sure that we're in public transit sitting at the table when those development sites are actually uh, procured. And can I just say, as we close this call, Chris, that um, I've heard over the years a call for RTA to be more transparent, more flexible, more connected to the community, and that this this program that you all are running is a demonstration that you're committed to doing that. Um, so I'm looking, really looking forward to what comes out of it, but I, I think you're really responding to what, at least I've heard, um, there's a call from for RTA. Thank you. We, we, look, we're, we look forward to, uh, to seeing what comes out of it ourselves. <laughs> so hopefully <laughs> we get people who are just excited. <laughs> Thank you all four of you for your for your time today to discuss this important issue with us and, and thank you especially to everyone who attended and submitted questions. Uh, a lot of great questions, a lot of questions unfortunately I couldn't get to um, on this call, but we will definitely follow up uh, and try to get answers to, to those who did submit questions uh, so we can make sure that everyone has their questions answered. Um, we will be sending out um, a follow-up email to all those who registered as well with more information about this program and how each of you can get involved in this. Uh, so hopefully that will also help address and answer some of the questions that we had come in as well. Uh, but thank you all for joining us again today and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.